Welcome to the 10 steps to writing a pitch book for institutional investors by Factorpad. My name is Paul and I'll be your guide. The goal is to provide the structure for a presentation to institutional investors so you can confidently speak to gatekeepers of large pools of assets. And this works whether you are presenting a mutual fund, separately managed account, or a hedge fund. We'll start with the investment strategy and firm background, and for the process part, we'll walk through a very basic stock selection model built with a hypothetical backtest instead of one with live money, and we'll pick it apart like an institutional investor would, analyze its performance, and then we'll draw some conclusions and wrap up. Okay, we have a lot to do, so let's get started. Step one, know your audience. Here's a simplified depiction of the marketplace I find helpful to zero in on the audience. Think about it this way. Individuals entrust their money to professionals, and professionals bundle that and allocate it to institutions. This is super simplified, of course, but offers a good starting point. Here's another way to think about it. Sophistication level low to high. And that's basic. And why? Because of the learning curve. It takes time to master the investment business as gains come slowly at first. Then with certifications, tests, and advanced coursework, knowledge levels pick up until they are refined and mastered. I'm not telling you anything new here. There's playing guitar in front of your family, a gig at a local bar, or in front of a stadium of adoring fans, right? And then fees, ballpark annual estimates here, but they generally hold true, a low just above zero to well over 2%. Let's look at the players in the professional category, registered investment advisors and a few others. The top three generally are compensated with fees and the bottom three with commissions. And this might be where you are now and let's look at where you are headed. This is the target audience we're setting out to impress and how will we do that? Let's start by covering what those in this group know, almost universally. First, strategies for the most part, mutual funds, SMAs, and hedge funds fit in one of several dozen strategies defined by Morningstar or other third-party databases. You can't come up with a product that won't be pigeonholed into a strategy. And next, the team. Well, you may be impressed with your 16 PhDs on staff, but Institutions have seen academics blow up funds, so you'll need to pitch more than just credentials here. Next, the process. Institutions have seen everything bottoms up, top down, global macro, quant, systematized, subjective, technical, and we'll walk through an example of how to describe a process to this audience. Institutions will also require that you have a benchmark so they can keep tabs on you from a risk and return standpoint. And speaking of comparisons, what is your peer group and who keeps tabs on it? Mutual funds are covered by Lipper and eVestment covers pension investments. And for your hedge fund, there are dozens of databases. Next, returns. How you present returns is vital and we'll cover suggestions. No longer will you be able to present data for one point in time. Institutions want more. And while a track record on real money is best, and preferably one that's been live for five to ten years, many times a hypothetical track record is all you have. So here we'll look at the more difficult example, a hypothetical. And perhaps the greatest differentiator between professionals and institutions is the ability to reliably measure and manage risk. This is a, an opportunity to rise above your competition, so we will spend some time here. And next, disclosures. How you handle legal disclosures may be glossed over at the individual level, but institutions do this for a living and they will read the fine print. And that takes us to our last point, due diligence. Institutions have the resources to specialize, their jobs depend on their success in evaluating managers. They cut right through the salesy, image-filled presentations and focus on the quality of their recommendations. Okay, now with that, we know our audience. Let's move on to step two. Step two, describe the strategy. 
First off, there are numerous strategies, often exotic ones, involving derivatives, commodities, futures, currencies, or more pl plain vanilla choices like stocks and bonds. You should be able to explain the strategy on one page. Let me show you the example stock strategy built specifically for this presentation. It's called Anacapa. And there's nothing magical about the name except that it's a small volcanic island off the coast of California. Start with the objective, which here is to provide long-term growth of capital through long-only positions in common stocks. And this allows the reader to zero in on where you compete. Also, we know stocks are variable investments, so periodic losses of principal can be expected. The next element, the description for Anacapa says, an actively managed strategy designed to provide exposure to large U.S. stocks plus achieve positive risk-adjusted active returns over the full market cycle. The key points, well, active versus passive, of course, in large U.S. stocks and risk-adjusted because that's required for institutions Full market cycle is a realistically long time frame for this type of strategy, meaning you're willing to wait three to five years, which also implies low turnover. You need to come across as realistic, and you've done, done this with a description like this. Next is structure. Notice how we keep getting more and more granular. Remember, institutions have seen hundreds of pitch books, so this allows them to zero in on where you fit. The strategy name may be pulled from a third-party database of peer group comparisons. And second, the benchmark here is the FactorPad 400 index, which we will cover later. Third is the exposure, which gives us a feel for beta exposure, meaning how much market-related risk is implied. And last, we note leverage isn't employed. Let's move on to goals. The candidate list refers to the universe of possible investments, and here we only include benchmark names. Again, this gives potential investors more certainty than saying something like all U.S. stocks, because institutions may worry about small and less liquid stocks. Next, keeping the low cash balances gives the investor certainty about their exposure to stocks, because Many want to retain the asset allocation responsibilities. The return and risk goals here seem reasonable as they match the long-term averages for large U.S. stocks. Next is correlation, which is high, but not so high that the institutional investor would worry that Anacapa is a closet index strategy. Okay, so that's a good start, and again, try to think of it from the recipient's end, whether you like it or not. They're trying to categorize your product and put you in their view of the world and into their asset allocation. Of course, you will be able to say how you are unique, but this is a good starting point to set the framework and zero their minds in on what you're all about. With that, let's move on to step three. Step three, explain who you are. Let's start with the company background. What is most important here? Well, your audience wants to get a feel for your stability, your continuity, professionalism, humility, insight, ethics, and passion. So start by covering the company founding in that light. Why was the company founded? Also, are there any tie-ins to the current purpose? Touch on the locations, timeline, structure, and other services and products offered. Here's a tip. Write each page so that it answers all of the who, what, where, when, why, and how questions. And you've basically done that here. Let's expand on the who part. Cover the experience, education, certifications, and affiliations of the portfolio management team and the management of the organization. It is also a good idea to include a photo. Some elect to drop in stock photos of retirees traveling happily and healthfully or confident executives shaking hands. I don't like that stuff, but I do think photos of the team can be very helpful. And here's mine. 
Of course, your presentation should fit with your company brand. So as you think about how to present it, here are two scales that may be helpful. First, what is the level of conservatism of your audience? Second, what is the level of subjectivity of your process? Meaning, are you pitching a structured process that leans on technology or towards high levels of subjectivity and how smartly your team makes decisions? One last graphic before I move on. Take a second to think about the asset management industry. There exists an inverse relationship between performance and the sales and marketing budget. Money will find positive, risk-adjusted, active performance, and we should all know how difficult that is to achieve. This industry is highly fragmented, and there are great economies of scale, meaning you can manage 50 million as easily as you can 50,000. And when the asset floodgates open, you can see why the industry produces billionaires. You may be able to increase assets with a less than spectacular track record at the retail level, but at the institutional level, that won't fly unless your sales team is highly connected and is comfortable kissing a lot of butt, which costs a lot of money. We'll talk more about this later. Okay, so for this Anacapa model example, let me run through the FactorPad story. My name is Paul, and I founded California-based FactorPad in 2013 to help investors achieve institutional-level results. I have over 25 years of experience overseeing as much as $5 billion in stock mutual funds after becoming a CFA charter holder, following a master's in business, and an undergraduate degree in finance. I have experience presenting to television audiences, fund boards, and institutional clients. FactorPad offers three services to help others with technical aspect, aspects of reaching the institutional level, education, research, and consulting. And in this video, you will witness an example of all three. It is an educational video with research on stock selection models, and finally, investment practice consulting. Also, for the brand for FactorPad, I hope it says something like this. A fresh, independent, tough to impress, experienced, detail-oriented firm that leans on technology and risk management in a fun and non-stuffy California style to help advisors focus less on image and more on substance and success. Whoa, that's a mouthful. Let's move on to step four and learn more about how to describe an investment process. Step four, describe the process. Let's start with suggestions for your page on the process. Again, trying to answer as many questions as you can while painting a picture, and then we'll cover Anna Kappa. The first point, uh, what is your active blend? I assume you're pitching an active process because if not, you're competing with Vanguard, State Street, and BlackRock and their commoditized ETFs with annual expenses of around 10 basis points. So you'll need to simply convey your active philosophy, and this graphic can help you position your product among the four investment philosophies. Some align themselves with one philosophy and push it as if it were a religion, and you typically find them in the corners. I like to call them the evangelists, and they claim the other practitioners are crazy. You'd be surprised. Some firms are highly successful using this approach. The passive random walkers claim active managers waste investor money. Technicians think fundamentals cloud the picture of the price action in a chart. And the fundamentalists say the math geeks are, lack real insight, and the quants, well... They think they're the masters of the universe. So which philosophies do you employ, and how do they all come together? I see merits in all philosophies and suggest that you address all four, keeping in mind that there will almost always be a quant who pours over the presentation, so be prepared. Next, describe your niche, your ex expertise, the source of market inefficiencies you have found, and finally, your edge. 
what do you find that everybody else ignores? And how do you exploit it for the benefit of investors? Keep in mind that the more subjective the process, the more weight investors will put on the track record of live money. And for rules-based subjective processes, you may be able to get uh, by with and raise money with a hypothetical backtest. Next is the workflow. Describe how, you, describe how you process economic signals and other inputs. Also, how are portfolio weights set? Do you employ an ad hoc rules-based approach or one that uses optimization tools in modern portfolio theory? Employing third-party risk models from Axioma, Barra, or Northfield? If so, mention your vendors and how the pieces are connected. Include ranges and exposures, meaning how large is a stock's position and by how far are sectors allowed to deviate from the benchmark. Also, any risk controls you can volunteer will be helpful. For example, do you tilt to value stocks or small caps? And showing exposures on a standard deviation scale will put the quants at ease. Non-investment risk controls are also helpful, such as describing the separation of duties and checks and balances. You will need to describe a solid system that is repeatable and measurable. And when I say system, it shouldn't be 100% automated. Rather, a combination of multiple inputs that all come together in your own unique way. Demonstrate how this system works over time, in good times and bad. With Anacapa here, we have a stock selection model, which may be called a screen, a, an equity rating model, an alpha model, even smart beta, depending on the context. Anacapa is a fundamental factor model, meaning it is designed for longer term periods, characterized by investing rather than trading. So months, quarters, and years instead of days, weeks, and hours. Shorter term models are often called algorithms and are more commonly used in high frequency trading situations. They focus less on fundamentals of companies and more on trading, volatility, volume, and technical signals. With that said, let's zip through the process for the Anacapa portfolios. Anacapa is less about building a funnel or a screen and more like building a box. Many use the funnel approach and here it would look like this. All 400 companies go into the hopper and 100 companies pop out. I don't find a funnel approach compelling myself because it is harsh on the companies that narrowly miss one screening criteria yet score very well on all others. To describe the process like building a box can be difficult because visualizing dimensions beyond three is difficult and that's really what is going on. This box involves a time series study and a cross-sectional study with time on one axis, stocks on another, and factors along another. Factors like size, sector, and style allow you to manage your bets and exposures which is what the quant in the room wants to see. So for Anacapa, here's how it works. Every month, starting with the 400 stocks in the Factor Pad 400 index, one fundamental factor, the book to price ratio, is calculated for every company. Those with the highest ratio are deemed the cheapest stocks. So we select the top 100 cheapest stocks, being mindful of market capitalization weights in each sector. Finally, we form a portfolio by equally weighting 100 stocks, so 1% in each stock. And that's it. Hold the stocks for one month and do the same thing one month later. This is a highly simplified strategy, but the one that we will use as the basis for the rest of this presentation. So let's move on to step five. Step five, select a benchmark. Let's cover benchmarks, and I should mention the terms benchmark, index, and bogey are often used interchangeably because indexes are often used as benchmarks, as in this case. So first of all, a benchmark is required. I've seen people act as though it's novel or unique, 
to say they don't have a benchmark, that they can go anywhere, thinking this is a positive di differentiator, well, I think they're wrong. The institutional audience wants to know what you do. And we'd all like to do whatever we want all the time, like a 15-year-old child. But the reality is you would be put into a category and given a benchmark that is unless you were born with the name George Soros. And pitching without a benchmark would only be advised for managers with long and established track records. And if you're there, then you're probably not watching this video. There are two types of indexes, total return and price indexes, with total return incorporating the effects of dividends. And a price index is used to communicate general market direction. Another nuance is that it is good to know if stocks are selected by committee, as with the S&P 500, or by a rules-based methodology like the Russell 2000 index. Next, let's talk about the five requirements when selecting a benchmark. First, characteristics must be known in advance so the active manager can make measurable bets and understand the risks. Second, the benchmark must be representative of the manager's investment approach. Third, the benchmark must be specific about stocks and weights ahead of time. Fourth, the rebalancing frequency must be realistic, meaning annual, quarterly, or monthly, and should roughly align with the active process. And fifth, there must be sufficient, sufficient liquidity to trade benchmark stocks. Next, there are four weighting methodologies for benchmarks. For the market capitalization type, the weights are set by multiplying outstanding shares times price. And the best, one, uh, best known one is the S&P 500. And two reasons these are popular. First, turnover is low because weights move up and down with prices. Second, weights based on market capitalization line up with important academic literature. Price weighting gives higher weights to stocks with higher prices, which, if you think about it, can make them prone to odd imbalances. The best known one is the Dow Industrials, but in my view, nobody in their right mind would use it for an active management benchmark. So let's just say that price-weighted indexes are only suitable for the news media to report broad stock price movements. Equal weighted indexes at times align with how active managers think, so some use them. However, they are less common because they give outsized weight to small companies. And last, firms started creating characteristic weighted indexes when cap weighted indexes underperformed after the dot com bubble in 2000. And these come in multiple flavors, dividend-weighted, risk-weighted, or fundamental ratio-weighted, and are most commonly used for smart beta index funds and ETFs. And one last point about methodologies. Benchmark providers typically provide a white paper de detailing all steps, including the linking of periodic returns, meaning daily, monthly, or quarterly. And the best is daily as it helps you adjust for cash flows and it shows the effect of significant corporate actions more accurately, but it's just a matter of precision and what you're willing to pay for. In some cases, as in alternative to licensing indexes from a large provider like S&P, Russell, or Dow Jones, some elect to create their own benchmarks because it can be expensive to license an index. The key variable here is whether you need to see daily holdings like an ETF provider does, being mindful that this will cost more. So the buy versus d build decision is yours, but be mindful that benchmarks do require maintenance and one way to quantify this is by reviewing the turnover ratio which can range from 1% to 5% annually for most passive versions and up to 20% or more for active, equal, or characteristic-weighted indexes. Some specialist managers create custom benchmarks themselves simply because it is more appropriate for their active management process.
So let's describe the factor pad 400 index quickly. It is a market capitalization weighted committee selected index that replaces acquired stocks on a quarterly basis and maintains sector weights that match the broad US equity marketplace. The factor pad 400 index has a start date of 1231.04 and if this helps, the correlation to the S&P 500 is nearly one at 0.99 with an R squared of 0.99 as well. We have 11 years of data and that's plenty to start getting a picture with monthly data. If you had a shorter period, you might insist on daily returns. And with that, let's move on to step six. Step six, identify a peer group. Your investment product type, whether it be a mutual fund, a separately managed account, or a hedge fund, determines where you and your investors will go to find competitive peer group data. For mutual funds, where funds are pooled, prices are reported daily, and are distributed to the public, there is a high level of liquidity, and the level of regulation is the highest among the three categories, as the SEC filing requirements are quite extensive. Here in the U.S., firms such as Morningstar and Lipper pick up the returns on stocks plus dividends and calculate returns. They also scour public filings and fill in the rest of their data sets with hundreds of data points. And the databases are then used by investors to perform due diligence and categorize funds into competing groups. For separately managed accounts, the picture is different here. We are talking about pension plans, platforms, or simply brokerage accounts managed by investment advisors. These come in a variety of flavors and the market is quite fragmented. Accounts are not pooled with other investors typically. The reporting from the investment advisor is normally monthly or quarterly. However, the account owner has access to her own account online so can check on activities daily. Here, the information is not as readily available to the public, and while liquidation may be quick, gaining access to funds may be slower than simply selling a mutual fund. And then hedge funds on the, of the three have the lowest level of regulation, although they are pooled, so third-party fund accountants calculate values. And here, service providers tend to be smaller, and the reporting is private rather than public. Hedging, leverage, and liquidity may be all over the map, and some hedge funds hold private securities that may only be valued at quarterly or monthly intervals. As such, there is much less standardization, and the reporting to third-party databases is voluntary at times. Another unconventional fact is that there are dozens of databases like Bloomberg, Barclays Hedge, and HFR, and the subscriptions come at a high cost rel relative to Morningstar, for example. There is a quick picture of the three main product types here. And so, again, it may be helpful to think of all of this using a scale. Mutual funds sit on this end of the scale. They're managed accounts followed by hedge funds over here. So the takeaway is identify which database your product will be covered by, subscribe to it, pull out competitive peer numbers, and you might be able to insert a graphic that looks like this in your presentation. This shows the range of past returns for a sample peer group with top quartile managers in the top line of this candlestick followed by the 50% in the middle and the lower quartile in the bottom. Here we have return on the y-axis and the trailing periods on the x-axis. So in this picture you can quickly see that the over the longer term periods the fund had top quartile performance and in the near term the performance was closer to the bottom quartile. It is best to identify your peer group yourself because if you don't it will be done for you and you may not like the outcome. Let's say for example you have a product with a long-term asset allocation between stocks and bonds of 50-50 and in the balance category on Morningstar there are many funds with an allocation of 60-40 and wouldn't that put you at a disadvantage? 
it would, especially after a strong run-up in stocks. And in this case, it may be helpful to get the data yourself and be more granular about picking true peers. This will show institutions that you are serious about your performance and that you are in tune with the marketplace. With that said, let's move on to step seven. Step seven, present returns. Let's start with a fairly standard return comparison table. And while here I'm showing both arithmetic and geometric returns, I'd suggest picking one method and sticking with it for consistency. Okay, looking at the data, so this book to price ratio and a kappa strategy posted a 74% premium or 6.21% per year without fees. Not bad. And geometric returns take compounding into consideration. So here, because we have such a long period, the outperformance is magnified. Let's look at it visually. Ah, here it is, the famous mountain chart using geometric returns. Some elect to plop one of these in front of investors and expect the institutional money to flow, but that may not, not work even with this type of outperformance. There are a few points of concern here, and so let's keep digging. Oh, I should mention a point about monthly active returns, and that's simply portfolio return minus the benchmark return. So institutions may be less impressed with long look back periods like above because it hides periods where active returns suffered. They will want you to explain when you outperform and when you don't. So demonstrate that across different market cycles because no matter what a salesperson says, no manager is infallible and every manager has hot streaks and cold spells. If you get ahead of this, you will earn credibility and differentiate yourself. And if you don't know when and why you underperform, then go find out. Three more points about active returns. First, one way to show active returns is to show rolling periods, which helps you identify outliers. And last, it may be helpful to break up the table above into two tables showing different economic cycles, for example. Okay, let's look at active returns graphically now. Here, in green, we have the monthly active return over time. And the red line is the rolling one-year active return. All of a sudden, several things pop out at you. Look at that one-month active return on the Anacapa strategy where it outperformed the benchmark by 13.56% in April 2009 right at the bottom of the financial crisis. Another point, notice how active returns were very wide during this period. In fact, after looking at this, it becomes clear why there was material separation here. Also, for the first five years, the investor would have experienced losses, net of fees. Notice how a chart like this gives a lot of transparency and allows the investor to focus on the time series instead of just one point in time. One thing I might do after reviewing this is explore the portfolio around the crisis looking at a variety of other risk measures, positions, and sector weights. Remember, this is a back test and running live money is quite different for a lot of reasons. If it were live money, I'd want to make sure that the manager would stick to her guns during the rough times like the financial crisis. Believe me, I remember those times vividly as I was responsible for $5 billion at the time. And we'll continue to pick Anna Kappa portfolio performance apart, but I do want to mention the process of building a back test. You know, that box I referred to earlier. A lot goes into it, prices, holdings, corporate actions, and mastering the software that ties it all together. I've done this myself in FactSet, and it can be an, ex an extensive project requiring hours of focus to sort out all of the details. And normally there is an individual or a team in charge, and they're often sectioned off like mad scientists. And in the end, you have something presentable with plenty of backups so you can field any questions that may come up. And one last tip, the more you disclose yourself, the more likely the audience will be engaged and trust your work. 
And with that said, there's a whole lot more to this, so let's keep digging and move on to step eight. Step eight, analyze risk. So we have a good start on performance analysis, but we need to analyze risk. And the goal for any institutional investor is to separate skill from luck. And to do that, we need to get comfortable with running regressions. Here is a table of data we need to collect. And first, I pulled forward the average return. Next, to get beta, using a regression of returns, we have the factor pad 400 on the x-axis and Anna Kappa on the y-axis. On the chart is the equation for the line of best fit. In y equals mx plus b format, and it shows a few important measures. 1.24 is the beta, and 0.38 is the alpha for each month. Recall alpha is one of several measures of risk-adjusted return and is where the line crosses the y-axis. An alternative format is y equals a for alpha plus b as in beta times the monthly return on the benchmark plus an error term. And that error term is very important but beyond the scope of this presentation. Okay, next, standard deviation of returns. And then tracking error is the standard deviation of active returns, which is 6.62, and it falls within the range for an active manager, meaning this wouldn't be considered a closet index fund, so a reasonable active management fee could be justified. Okay, let's proceed to another table and collect several risk-adjusted return measures. I've used a simplified method here, and the trainer ratio is the average return divided by beta, for Anna Kappa and then the, the benchmark. For the sharp ratio, we divide by standard deviation. And then Jensen's alpha is 0.38 from above annualized. And the information ratio is the active return of 6.21 divided by this tracking error. Okay, I'm reluctant to dive into a lot of interpretation here, but Taking a step back, it looks like fairly material outperformance. You could supplement this with statistical significance measures, and of course use judgment as to the audience before dumping a bunch of quantitative measures in the presentation. To me, a better way to present this is with rolling charts again. Here is a chart that shows a three-year rolling window of important measures over time. Notice how the alpha was materially positive in the post-crisis period we covered on the previous page. A beta, it was fairly consistent, but did exceed the long-term goals from step two for the period ending in 2011. Also, tracking error exceeded 10 for the period, uh, two-year period after the crisis, and this figure might be too high for some institutions. On, and then looking here, it's t too low for that post-2012 period, possibly. I could keep going, but this isn't the time for it. I simply wanted to show you a graphic that is useful for further explanation and expansion of the analysis. Also, Many people label this level of analysis quant, and if you do, I think you're being naive. I, I mentioned the level of sophistication at the institutional level, and they're perfectly comfortable going here, whether you put a hypothetical or a real track record in front of them. At the institutional level, risk and outcomes are measured, and there are a whole host of other measures I've skipped. Why do you think the money is flooding into shops like Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street, plus the smart beta and index products wrapped into ETFs? And on the internet, robo-advisors are designing asset allocation models, and most are in highly controlled products with low fees, and all of these companies manage their risk exposures and other risk control very tightly. So I think the best thing is to just accept it and if you need help in putting this together, seek that out. I should also mention there are two versions of performance analysis, returns-based, which we are using here, and holdings-based, 
which offers a more granular and daily look. Moving from monthly returns-based to holdings-based kicks up the technical and software requirements, but is what most institutions with over $1 billion in assets eventually build out. Okay, with that said, let's move on to step 9. Step 9. Present disclosures. Let's look at a suggestion on disclosures. I'm not a lawyer, so this isn't legal advice, and, but with that said, I will give presentation advice. Some present a page with the notes on the hypothetical track record together with the legalese, and I prefer to do it differently. This is the way some do it, with legal disclosures and disclaimers written in god-awful style like this are instantly off-putting, it screams don't read me and run away. We have to be honest with ourselves, face it, when seeing this the audience will instantly tune out. Geez, you probably tuned out. So, a preferred method would be a note written in the same presentation style about how investing involves risk. It can be a summary statement or two you've seen before, like the one about how past performance is no guarantee of future performance. And on top of that, of course, there will be fine print, but I suggest moving it to an appendix and making a kindly worded reference to it here. Next, let's tackle a few best practices on presenting a live track record and then move on to those for our hypothetical backtest. And a hypothetical backtest is looked at with a higher level of scrutiny for obvious reasons because there wasn't real money under management. It is also implied that the hypothetical was created in-house, meaning not independently, increasing the level of doubt. Another distinction is that with live money, it is easier to incorporate the effective fees. Okay, first, mutual funds, because they are for both accredited and non-accredited investors and are highly regulated by the SEC in the United States, a requirement is daily portfolio accounting of all fee accruals and fair value pricing, dividends, accrued interest, and corporate actions. So the fund accountant is responsible for what they call striking an NAV or a net asset value for each share on a daily basis. Third party providers like Morningstar pick up that NAV plus periodic dividends and calculate returns for the general public. So for mutual funds, the scrutiny by institutions is likely the lowest because the variety of providers ensures accuracy. And this is the world I lived in for 10 years, and believe me, there are a lot of players involved. Next, hedge funds, while the regulatory scrutiny is lower here, accounting can be monthly or quarterly, and fund accounting may be performed by smaller companies that may have a connection with the hedge fund manager, resulting in higher probability of fraud and inaccuracies and conflicts of interest at times. In most cases, however, accounting is reliable and can be trusted. So at a minimum, though, institutions will vet out the service providers. Third, separately managed accounts or SMAs include pensions, platforms, and a whole host of other structures, as mentioned earlier. And here the investment advisor oversees a portfolio, typically with discretion, and the account custody is provided by a bank or brokerage firm. So here the asset manager is responsible for keeping the track record, so there is a higher level of doubt. And one way to combat this is to follow standards for accurately creating composites and accounting for cash flows. And one way to alleviate concerns is to follow what is called GIPs or GIPs um, for the global investment performance standards. Next, I've laid out a number of important facts about this hypothetical backtest. And any independence here can be helpful, meaning a third-party certification of the calculation. Also, show the return stream like this in a table, where I listed the top three rows and provide the series to the institutional investor so they can play with the data themselves. They may run it through their own risk model to determine exposures to risk factors. And this will allow them to independently determine how much of the performance was based upon skill or luck. And with that, let's move on and wrap up. Step 10, prepare for the Q&A. 
As you prepare for the presentation, let's think about the institutional gatekeeper's motivations. And excuse me if this is a little direct and unconventional, but it's my honest view. First of all, recall what I said about the inverse relationship between the net risk-adjusted performance and the sales and marketing budget. With that as a backdrop, I'll start with the gatekeeper's motivations covered by the old adage, it's who you know, not what you know. Meaning, in a video like this, I won't be able to help you with the relationship building aspect of your presentation, but you have to know how important that part is. I've been, I've seen some very suspect investment products over the years that gained significant assets simply through strong sales and promotion. The first motivation for a decision maker is don't go to prison, followed by don't lose my job and license. And this sounds like a joke, but there is a material level of legal liability associated with selecting investments. So this concern is probably top of mind. And it's been a few years since the Bernie Madoff fiasco, but it's a good reminder to put yourself in the seat of the institutional um, inv investor, the individual responsible for allocating billions of dollars. And never forget the stakes are high. So next at the presentation, be mindful that everyone wants to look good in front of their boss. And next, while uncommon in the final analysis, some may take a meeting or advance your firm as a favor to a friend and as another consideration, remember that people want to work with those they like, and maybe this all shouldn't be a popularity contest, but oftentimes it is. And next, many people copy other people they perceive to be smart. How else do you think Bernie Madoff was able to raise billions of dollars for his Ponzi scheme? You've heard how people like to brag at cocktail parties about which hedge fund they own. And in some circles, that is commonplace. They may not know the details of how the strategy fits mathematically with their holdings, uh, but that often doesn't matter. Sad but true. Others may be motivated to get an aggressive salesperson off their back. You know, selling asset management is difficult without strong performance, so the rewards are lucrative, and it takes a lot of energy to pretend to be somebody's friend and so now and again, clients will throw a salesperson a bone for being persistent. And along the same lines, institutions are throwing a lot of swag, you know, dinners at exclusive restaurants and hard to get tickets to the big game. So that wraps up some of the less desirable, like salesy aspects of the presentation that most people know but rarely acknowledge. And frankly, they give the industry that I love a bad name, unfortunately, but there's nothing I can do about that. What I can help with is the technical aspects of your presentation for when you speak to the institutional gatekeepers who know the numbers, the benchmarks, the competitors, risk-adjusted returns, and can confidently say yes if you stand out. They're intellectually curious and take their fiduciary responsibility seriously. And oftentimes the buck stops with the one or two decision makers in the room who, in my experience, everyone leans on because the technical aspects are not easy to learn. Other more routine questions you should be prepared to answer include, you know, a doozy like, if equity markets are so efficient, what is the economic justification for your process to continue to outperform? Or more common requests such as describe your hiring process and view on staff retention or what changes to the investment process have been made or intended in the future. Explain your service provider due diligence process and changes to accountants, legal or other service providers. And how do you measure and guard against style drift? All very valid questions. Okay, with that, all said, uh, hopefully this presentation helps with how to prepare for the second group here, you know, those that know that at times and for specific audience, it really is what you know. Okay, so let's wrap up and 
In the end, let's say I was the institutional gatekeeper in charge, what would I say about the Anacapa stock selection model? Well, first of all, I would run the same return stream against a value benchmark and peer group instead of the blend like the factor pad 400 index. And remember how the beta was higher than the original estimate from step two? That's the first clue. Also, I'd strip out the outlier month right at the bottom of the financial crisis and run all of the numbers again. Third, I might try some additional statistical tests, including confidence levels, meaning is the alpha statistically different from zero? Fourth, I'd run all of this through a risk model so I could capture size and style exposures over time. And I'd certainly have a whole host of other questions to follow up with. And where would I categorize this on the range of philosophies? You know, it's hard to say, but I'd probably place this orange dot here as if, you know, it's a blend between one fundamental factor. But because there's only a small amount of subjective human judgment involved, I would categorize it mostly as a quantitative structure that leans heavily on the benchmark, you know, by owning 100 of the 400 stocks. And if you wish to learn more about any of the concepts covered here, we have other resources available for a classroom approach. I suggest diving into our boot camp. And here's a link to the playlist if you'd like to have any help with any of the technical or statistical concepts touched on in this video. Basically, you walk through the calculations in Excel using one set of data we provide using four stocks to keep things simple. And the videos range from 15 to 35 minutes and include a short lecture, a few exercises, and we take time to have a little fun too. It's on YouTube now with no sign up and there's also an organized list of the videos on factorpad.com. And speaking of factorpad.com, the website, it's easy to get a feel for what we're up to. Take five minutes to poke around. It's like 15 pages or so. And check out the jobs, our background, the research offerings. And, you know, we have a free newsletter and models and a few other things. We also have a glossary of terms and even a list of innovators in the field of finance. And here's a link to the glossary playlist on YouTube. We also publish new videos periodically, and you can click here to be alerted about these new opportunities to learn and advance your business to the institutional level. And one more piece of advice, get comfortable with the numbers. Did you notice that throughout the whole presentation I didn't drop one of these on you? And many people do, but I wouldn't suggest it. In fact, it's a factor pad company rule not to show Greek symbols. And I did break the rule to make just this point. But, you know, while this portfolio variance formula might be interesting to you and me, nobody wants to be made to feel stupid. And only a small fraction of people in this industry are comfortable speaking Greek. Okay, thank you for your time and to watch this video. It is it is a long one, and I'm grateful for your time. In the future, please think about FactorPad as kind of the opposite of a public company you can never reach by phone. Instead, think of me more as a professional on call, and many firms have a CPA or a lawyer on call. So see me in the same light as a CFA on call for when the technical details become overwhelming. And this whole video is my work, so you can be confident that I am comfortable working with the minutia as I am with your branding team. And mes message me on Twitter at FactorPad and at Paul Allen Davis, and let me know what you'd like to see us tweet, and same thing on our YouTube channel. And I live on feedback, so please take the time to comment. And if you'd like someone qualified to handle a pitch book for you, reach out to me by using the contact form on the FactorPad website. And that form sends information directly to me. No middlemen, no mailing lists, and no spam. FactorPad is a young company, and we're a bit unconventional, meaning instead of building a big sales force to bang on people's doors, we're demonstrating our capabilities online. So those who have seen our work and like what they see, We'll take the initi initiative and reach out. And so the ball's in your court, and I'll be here to help. Okay, thanks again for your time today. I hope you had fun. 
with the 10 steps to writing a pitch book for institutional investors.